Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode where I'm talking to Dr. Ted Poston. Are you at Arizona State University? Is that right? <laughs> at something the University beginning with an a. Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, something beginning with an A. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah. it wrong. Um, we're going to be talking about cumulative case arguments um, for God today and ge generally kind of like a Bayesian framework as it's used in philosophy of religion as well. Um, Ted's kind of put forward the argument in favor of Christian theism, but so we're going to talk specifically about some of those points, but a lot of it will be about the general form, I suppose, and things like that. So the first question then that I've got is, you know, what is the form of a cumulative case argument? How does it work? Yeah, so cumulative case arguments you find, you know, in a lot of contexts where you have a body of evidence and you're trying to figure out, you know, what that body of evidence suggests. So in legal context, you know, this is probably the simplest example where, you know, you have a large body of facts, you know, relating to whether a defendant is innocent or guilty, and you look for um, what's the best explanation of all those facts, right? So in general, when you're thinking of a cumulative case argument, you're thinking of inference to the best explanation, right? So you've got some facts, you've got, you know, a group of plausible theories, and then you have um, a claim that one theory um, explains the facts better than the rest of the plausible theories. And so that gives you some reason right, to believe that theory. Awesome. And, yeah. Oh, sorry. Feel free to go ahead if you can say something else. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, um, so that's in general, like how IBE works. Um, and what I've done um, in some of the papers you've read, I guess, is to um, try to clarify and sort of, um, you know, um, get a more workable form of inference to the best explanation by using the Bayesian apparatus. So in, in terms of like um, people calling themselves Bayesians, Bayesians in general in epistemology, like it, do, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're using one particular kind of formula or anything like that, does it? Like someone could call themselves a Bayesian, but be using like a different kind of model for how they're kind of conditionalizing or like um, target, modeling their credences about certain things. Is that right? Well, it, and it gets, uh, there are a lot of varieties of Bayesianism. I think I.J. Good calculated that there were, you know, thousands and thousands of kinds of, of Bayesians. Um, but like the core part of uh, Bayesianism really is, is twofold. One is the idea that your beliefs should be modeled on the probability calculus, so they should have a probability model. And the other is that uh, when you acquire new evidence, you should update in accord with Bayes' theory. Right. So um, that's like the core thing. So everyone who calls themselves a Bayesian will be updating uh, the evidence in accord uh, with Bayes' theorem. OK, awesome. So um, the first kind of set of questions that I've got then about the way that you've used it in some of your arguments and things is going to be to do with our like prior probabilities or maybe actually before that. Should we talk about what's the difference between probability and likelihood? Because they're both kind of going to come up. So, what what is the difference between? Oh uh, yeah. So this is actually maybe a place where it would be um, helpful to share my screen. Sure. Um, so what I want to do here is I'll write out Bayes' theorem and then um, just talk about some of those. Um, yeah, some of that terminology. So. Let's see how this works. Can you guys, yeah. can you see that? Okay. Yeah, I've got it. So um, what I'm going to do is write up here um, this term, which is known as the posterior probability of a hypothesis. So you can think of H as a claim. H and E are both claims. You can think of H as a hypothesis and E as some evidence. And we want to know, like, how likely does that evidence make the hypothesis? And what Bayes' theorem says is that this is... Um, equal um, to a specific fraction, um, where on the top you have the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis, and that's multiplied by uh, the prior of the hypothesis. And down here you have um, the, like, the um, prior of the evidence. So when we talk about likelihoods, right, this term whoops, in the numerator, the probability of H given E is known as the likelihood. And you said probability. I mean, so you have these likelihoods and then you have these prior probabilities, right? And so um, these two come apart. In order to use Bayes' theorem, you have to have the likelihoods have to be defined and then the prior of the hypothesis has to be defined. So 
So that so then in terms of these prior probabilities, then and I've got a kind of group of a few questions about about priors and how we use them in this kind of context. Okay. Um, like so, what does it represent? Is it like an objective probability? Is it a subjective kind of assessment of my like credence in a certain proposition? Like where where does a prior come from? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, Bayesians. Um, Typically, Bayesians are what are known as subjective Bayesians. So they think that the priors just come from your beliefs, right? So in a way, your your best guesses um, as to what the probability is. But there's no constraints on that as long as right there's a probability function that I'm going to stop the share for now. As oh, long yeah, as sure. as long as there's a probability function that captures those judgments, they're fine. This is known as the requirement of just co coherence, right? Other um, folks tend to be more objective uh, Bayesians and think, no, uh, you know, if you're giving, um, you know, um, a prior on, um, you know, the moon's made out of green cheese is, you know, uh, you know, 0.9 or something, there's something wrong with that kind of prior. Uh, so you have a whole bunch of like attempts to try to um, understand what constraints there could be on objective priors. Um, so you have things like the principle of indifference, you have, um, you know, uh, the principle principle, which basically says, you know, like, look, if you know the objective chance of a particular proposition, then that's what, you know, your prior should be on that and so on. So um, in terms of as well, if someone has like no priors about something before a piece of evidence, are they able to sort of be a Bayesian about it? So say, I don't know, some some piece of evidence comes along and that sort of pushes you towards a new theory, but you just don't have a prior about that theory beforehand. What does that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it gets kind of tricky. I mean, I tend to think of this as just a modeling perspective. You know, it's like if you have a theory, for example, that you've never thought of before, you know, so perhaps you just have never really considered theism. And so you just have no, you know, prior on it whatsoever. We can say, okay, well, let's just model what impact this evidence would have if, right, you had um, a prior on theism in such and such a range, right? And then you can just model it, but it does require that you, you know, come up with sort of ranges, uh, at least for uh, these priors. So Perfect. in terms, of, oh, sorry, you go ahead. No, go ahead, yeah. Um, so in terms of like the prior probability of theism, then in the particular arguments that you've put forward in a few places, um, there's a paper that you've written called the um, the, the simplicity of gra the intrinsic probability of yeah. grand explanatory theories. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what you're looking at there is how do you get at the prior of something like theism? Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about how you go about doing that? Like what it what is this intrinsic pro uh, probability? Theory? Yeah, sure. So um, as we saw with Bayes' theorem, it requires if you're going to update. Um, a hypo the probability of a hypothesis on some evidence, you need at least two pieces of information. You need the likelihood and you need the prior, right? And some people argue, well, when you come with these grand, you know, explanatory theories like theism, I mean, they have a prior that, you know, is pretty much negligible. You know, if it's not zero, it's so close to zero that it doesn't make a difference, right? And so it's really important uh, when you're thinking about explanatory reasoning in general that you start with plausible theories. Right. And so um, in this paper, what I'm doing is I'm proposing a way to think about the plausibility of, you know, big explanatory theories. Right. And the basic idea there is that we reason about, you know, how much um, uh, a theory leaves sort of intrinsically unexplained. Right. So if a theory is positing uh, limits, right, then that's a strike against it because there's no explanation for why those limits exist. Right, so it would be a it would be an odd thing. Um, I mean, one way to think about this, just is in terms of like natural sciences, right? You might ask, well, can human beings, you know, grow to be a hundred feet tall, right? And it would be a weird thing if it was somehow or another there was just an arbitrary limit, like in the laws of nature, that said people cannot grow beyond you know sixteen feet, right? It's better when you have a structural explanation for why people can't grow that tall. And we can, using facts about human physiology, the way the heart pumps blood and the relative strength, right, um, of the vessels to, you know, hold, um, you know, uh, to hold pressurized blood and stuff, you know, and like if, you know, you had a person that was 100 feet tall, they would, um, you know, have to have a heart that's so big and the pressure in the vessels would be so great that you just couldn't, uh, 
right, pump blood to all the various parts of the body without it just, you know, <laughs> exploding. Um, right, so that's kind of a structural explanation for why there's some limits. And, and I think what this shows is that we do have these kind of intuitions that, um, you know, views are worse off for having arbitrary limits. And so we can take that, this is roughly an explanatory intuition, and we can take that and then apply it to grand theories. And what I do in the paper is I say, okay, well, let's consider some plausible, or let's consider some candidates people have proposed for grand theories. And it turns out that this doesn't um, get past the plausibility filter. And so when we think about, you know, what views get past the plausibility theory, we have a lot of the classic views from uh, the religious traditions of the world, right? So I think, excuse me, theism, right, gets past this. It posits, you know, one being a pure limitless intentional power, right? So this is a being that has, for instance, intentions, beliefs, and desires, um, and there's no limits on this, and there's just one of them. Um, that another sort of view is just naturalism, which I think that thinks that, um, I mean, I don't want to go too much de yeah. detail. Yeah. Get, give a precise definition of naturalism and theism, please. <laughs> in, yeah, in, yeah. In so, 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think naturalism, you know, uh, needs to say something like, you know, every contingent possibility is realized in some world or other, you know, and so on. Right. But you can use this kind of plausibility uh, reasoning to say, you know, you might start off thinking, oh, there's tons of these views. And so they each had none of them are plausible because there's so many and saying, no, actually, you know, there's a small number of these theories that are plausible. And then it makes sense to look for evidence to determine, you know, which one's more reasonable than the other. In light of sort of what you just said um, there about these types of theories, I mean, someone like Sean Carroll would criticize theism, I think, as an explanation, because he'd say it, the one problem with it is it really isn't inconsistent with any observation. You know, it doesn't tell you why something is like this way rather than that. Um, it just, it, you know, it's going to it's going to fit to almost anything. Is that being... I don't know, is that, is that in conflict with what you had to say there about the kind of not putting limits on things? Or is that a different um, type of concern altogether? Yeah, I would think that's a different concern relating to trying to figure out what the values are for certain of the likelihoods, like how probable certain kinds of evidence is with theism. And if I understand his line correctly, his view is that, um, you know, for any item of evidence, it's not the case that theism makes it more likely um, than any other item of evidence. I mean, you know, th there's sort of two issues going on. One is like theism is consistent with any um, empirical observation. And the other issue is that uh, theism doesn't make any predictions about what kinds of evidence um, we'd see. So, so technically you could just grant the point and say, okay, yeah, well, you know, theism is consistent uh, with any kind of evidence, but this is just a general Quinean point that if you make adjustments in theory, you know, elsewhere, you can accommodate pretty much anything. Um, um, but that doesn't show that uh, theism doesn't predict certain kinds of um, evidence over others. Okay. Maybe, I, I mean, I guess that's maybe a slightly different point than that. If we are going to talk about it more, maybe when we talk about some of the likelihood ratio things, I think mm -hmm. one um, last point about priors would be a concern about assigning priors sort of after we're already aware of all the evidence. So, Say, you know, like in the philosophy of religion department, um, for example, we might um, already ha have kind of um, theories about the way the world is. And then we say, you know, I'm going to come and do Bayes about this. I'm going to assign a prior. But really, we've got a bunch of like hindsight bias going on. How can we eliminate for that in doing this? You can never eliminate that kind of <laughs> hindsight bias. I mean, you're just like, you know, maybe I'm guilty as charged. I mean, I think the thing is, is you try to articulate theories that, um, um, in a way, ground what the relevant priors are. And, you know, this is um, this is what I'm doing in that one paper, the intrinsic probability of grand theories is, and then, all right, well, here's a general view about how you would go about assigning um, non-trivial priors to these, you know, grand explanatory theories, you know, and as long as the reasoning is principled, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, it's reasonable to do so. But yeah, I mean, this is one of the worries about, I would think of a kind of a, just a purely subjective Bayesian kind of view is like, oh, I just assign the priors, whatever I want to assign them. And then it's like, well, hold on a minute. There's really no principled reason for them. Might you be um, guilty of, you know, incorporating in a whole bunch of evidence that you're not accounting for.
right yeah yeah it, so it's almost like um i mean it's obviously going to be a sword that cuts both ways against anyone arguing for any position using this framework but yeah. it's almost something that can't be got around you just try and mitigate for it as much as possible yeah exactly so um likelihood ratios then um Specifically, I suppose, in the case of the arguments for theism, what is being said when we say that some evidence is more likely given theism? Um, you're, you're saying exactly that. <laughs> you're, well, you're saying, yeah, yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> you're saying that, you know, um, when you consider um, some evidence um, in theism that it has uh, a relatively high um, uh, probability relative to what your alternative is. Um, so if I could, uh, this, is, this is what I thought, thought would be helpful is I'll write a different form of Bayes' theorem okay, uh, sure. on, yeah. on the uh, on word. So let's see. So there's a form of Bayes' theorem. Let's see if I can go over here. All right. So this is the, um, this is the simple form of Bayes' theorem. Ta -da, ta -da. Okay, so insert equation. And so what I'm going to write up now is what is known as uh, the odds form of Bayes' theorem. So the odds form is what you get when you're comparing um, uh, confirmation of two uh, specific hypotheses to one another. So suppose we want to compare um, hypothesis one Right, the probability of hypothesis one, given some evidence, we want to compare that to the probability of hypothesis two, right, given some evidence. And this, let's see if I can get out of this, um, is going to equal um, a fraction. Whoops. There we go. Probability of that evidence um, given that hypothesis over probability of that evidence um, given the other hypothesis. That's going to be multiplied by, where'd my um, equation stuff go? There it is. Um, probability H2, and then we got up here the of H1. Okay, so this is known as the odds form. And you can kind of see how the odds form relates to this. I mean, you would have, you would fill out the hypothesis H1 and H2, and you'd have this. They both have the same denominator, E, so you can get rid of them, right? And just compare the ratio of the two to the relevant numerators, right? But this term over here is known as the likelihood term, yeah. right? So you're considering you know, take, for example, um, you know, just a really simple um, example. Um, suppose you're selecting from two different urns. One urn has uh, two thirds white balls and the other urn has one third white ball, um, white balls in it. And you ask, OK, well, what's the probability of um, selecting um, a white ball from urn one relative to uh, the probability of selecting um, a white urn? A white ball from urn two, and you think, oh, well, it's clearly going to favor the one, right? The one's two thirds, the other's one third. And so the likelihood ratio here would have a value of two. All right. Yeah. Um, so does that sort of help understand what a likelihood ratio here is? And then here's the priors right over here. And one cool thing about just thinking about the odds form is that if you're worried about like the priors, you can just think, all right, well, let's just think about the evidence. What does the does the evidence favor one hypothesis over the other? And if it turns out that the evidence, you know, is just overwhelming, right, um, uh, in in terms of one view over the other, then you can think, okay, we have reasonable concerns about how to base these priors, but we have enough, like, there's enough sense of like what the relative ratios are that we could determine, you know, maybe the evidence, right, is just so great that you're getting, you know. Uh, you know, significant confirmation for one rather than the other. So that's kind of what I like about that uh, that framework, right? Is that you can separate out issues of, you know, let's think about how likely the evidence is given the theories, and then let's separate out the issues of the priors. Yeah. So I think 
another question then sort of similar i mean we asked about where where do the numbers come from for the priors but it's sort of going to be you know where do those numbers come from for that we assign to likelihood ratios because i think mm -hmm. um in the, in the um example you gave with urns full of balls it's quite easy to see you know why those likelihoods would be what they are yeah. um but maybe in something like um you know if i if i'm comparing like how expected it is that there'd be noises coming from my attic, like given that there are gremlins in my attic or something like that versus noises that there aren't gremlins in my attic. It's kind of going to be like, well, how, how do I really get at what that number is? You know, like, yeah. do I, do I kind of think about like how much I'd be willing to place on a bet, but then how do I sort of factor out the value of the bet in that rather than just to get at the credences? Like how, how do we do that in these more sort of, complicated cases where it isn't like you know a roll of a dice or the flip of a coin where we can clearly see that there's like two possible outcomes of equal chance or something. yeah that's an excellent question i mean there are going to be some cases where it's inscrutable or you're just like eh, i don't know um there will be other cases where you won't be able to assign a, a specific value but you could say like roughly you know one is greater than the other and then you might be able to say, OK, well, is it an order of magnitude greater, two orders of magnitude greater? You know, how um, how much more expected is the evidence? Right. And what I do in my work on this, some of this is not published, but um, what I do is just say, OK, well, let's think about some of these cases and figure out what we think is a plausible range. And usually like um, so fine tuning evidence, for example. Right. I think most most people who think about this think that. Um, if you're thinking about the relevant evidence for fine tuning given theism over the relative evidence of fine tuning giving, given kind of a single world naturalism, pretty much everyone in the debate has come to the view that uh, that evidence strongly favors theism over um, a single universe naturalism, right? And you can't say, well, how great, but you can say, okay, well, let's, you know, at least, you know, five or orders of magnitude greater. Right, which is just a, it's like a heuristic way of expressing a judgment that it's much more significant. And so what's cool about that is like, if you think that evidence has like, is five orders of magnitude in favor of theism, then you have to think, okay, well, um, what's the relevant ratio with the priors such that you might not be moved um, by this evidence, right? And so it, it, it gives you... Um, I think a set of very clear cut, um, uh, uh, really clear questions that you can ask, you know, if you agree on the evidential power of the evidence, then um, uh, what do you have to say about the priors? I, I think um, like in that case, for example, I just don't know how I would actually get at assigning numbers to something like that. Like say in the case of fine tuning, um, I'd think, well, um, say fine tuning given naturalism. Well, I don't really know what the necessary and sufficient conditions are for life, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know how I could then go about say, you know, like assigning what kind of section of the probability space that like contains life, may maybe like exotic forms of life or life different from ours. And then that similarly for sort of the numerator on that, like given say theism, I mean, it, even in that probability space of not theism would be like naturalism and a bunch of other stuff, I guess. But, um, you know, like for, for theism as well, I think you defined it as the way Swinburne does, uh, the hypothesis that there is a being of necessarily pure, limitless, intentional power. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know how much on that, how much of that probability space I expect to be actions where like life is created in a world as well. So, yeah. I mean, does it come down to I, I'm just saying I'm not really sure how I go about assessing that, yeah. but does it come down to like I've got the wrong intuitions? Like where what's if you've got different intuitions on that, how do we kind of um reason through that? Yeah. So if it just turns out to be like a classic cl clash of intuitions, right, that'd be really bad. So um that's the part where you really need to spend some time trying to argue for, you know, particular um um claims as for, you know, so Swinburne's uh, approach, for example, on this is say, okay, well, you know, there's something productive about goodness that a good being would want to bring about other, right, uh, good beings that resemble uh, them in knowledge, power, and goodness, right? And then he gives, you know, his argument, well, this is going to require that we're able to get at one another, you know, in some sense, you know, 
beans will have to have a location, right? Um, and so he gets, you know, from this an argument that there needs to be a physical world where individuals have bodies, right, in some sense or another, right? And so this is a way of trying to derive from um, um, the the just the pure or the simple hypothesis of theism that um, you're going to need individuals with bodies, uh, which will give you, um, you know, obviously like you know uh, a life permitting world, right? Um, and then, you know, so that's one one part of the argument. And the other part of the argument is going to be arguing, well, if single universe naturalism is true, right, this means that, right, either this world just um, has always existed or it popped into existence. And then you have your arguments, you know. I mean, I think the idea that the world just popped into existence is absurd. Um, so, you know, you think, okay, well, the universe has always existed. And you think, okay, well, this involves, like, positing a whole bunch of... Um, 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 uh, you know, specific properties to this world, right? And then how likely is it that we would think that a world would have these kinds of properties? And uh, there, you know, you might, you might say, well, is it just as likely as theism? Is it less likely as theism? And I guess that at that point, um, you know, thinking most people are going to say, well, yeah, you know, it's it's less likely, right, than theism would be. And then that that's all you need. I mean, of course, you know, with these cumulative case arguments, I mean, there's a lot of different places for people to push back on, right? So they can yeah. say, okay, well, yeah, I'll give you that, but let's talk about evil. And you're like, okay, so now we got to go over to that, yeah. um, you know, um, part of the argument. But, you know, again, just the cool thing about um, thinking about this in terms of likelihood ratios, um, what we haven't also talked about is this independence. Um, yeah, of course. Ratio. But if if the evidence uh, if the evidence meets this independence condition, then it turns into a very sort of simple um, uh, numbers game where you just can um, you can just basically just add and subtract various powers. And so it it I think what it does is it removes this um, intuition that people have thought has been necessary for cumulative case arguments. Is somehow or another you kind of survey right, the whole force of the arguments. And you say, oh yeah, this is really powerful. But here you get a much more sort of um, structured, you know, piecemeal approach where you can think about this particular part, think about this particular part, this particular part. And then if they're subject to these independence conditions, you can just add and subtract the relevant evidence. Or the, I, th the I, think as, I think as you're kind of talking about, so like the way that if I disagreed about the way, like what I think the probability of some piece of evidence is, like given um, given some explanation, um, and if we kind of differ about those numbers, the way we'd appeal to that, it seems like it'd be very difficult to, I mean, because presume it, what, what I'm trying to say, I think is presumably you've got to appeal to some reason that the other person is committed to. Whereas if someone's an atheist or a theist or anywhere in between, it seems like they're going to have, if they've thought about it to any degree, they're going to kind of have a coherent set of beliefs about the way that the world is or metaphysics and stuff. So it's going to be quite difficult, I think, to appeal to um, these sort of further reasons. It's something along the line of, um, you know, like Oppie's criticism of deductive arguments, where it's like, well, say Pro offers an a deductive argument for some something, right? Um, and Khan is like, well, Obviously, I reject one or more of these premises. And then they, you know, Pro gives another deductive argument for one of the premises. Like, yeah, I just reject another one. And it's like, do we just kind of keep doing that? Or, or but, but then I think, I think it becomes very difficult for how you kind of model disagreement because you'd want to be able to say, you know, you can make some progress. You're not just like in your kind of bubble yeah. of coherent beliefs and can't. But yeah. in, in terms of when it comes to this probabilistic thing, is there something similar going on? You know, like if if I'm assessing that likelihood ratio differently, and that and to you, do you just kind of appeal to some other belief that I might not share, or do you have like do you have to come into the set of beliefs that I have to kind of offer me reasons to support something? I, yeah. So so that's a yeah. really complicated issue, and you asked a yeah, couple. Yeah. Of, there's like, a few. Uh, yeah. There's a ton yeah, of that, so. couple different <laughs> questions there that I think are are you know very pressing uh, yeah. questions. I mean, one way to think about this is just take it out of the philosophy of religion context for a minute and just think about, you know, uh, in epistemology, you know, the debate between, you know, uh, 
people who hold that, yeah, we do have knowledge of the external world and people that no, we don't know anything about the external right. world. I mean, one of the, um, one of the, the, the conclusions I think that people realized about this debate is that it's, it's very difficult to um, <laughs> maybe even impossible to offer like a skeptic, right? An argument, right? That's going to convince the skeptic that skepticism is false. Right. right. And so people think, well, you know, is that what the goal is, right? In trying to argue for uh, the claim that we do have knowledge of the external world. So, well, that better not be the goal, right? Because if that's the goal, we failed. Right. Right. And so the thought is like, no, we just need to be, we need to, you know, argue um, for, um, you know, kind of a, a roughly common sense view of knowledge in ways that, um, you know, are plausible and we found and we find satisfying. So I think the the um, you know so I think you know there's similar dynamic going on when you're thinking about these probabilistic judgments is um, in the context of you know philosophy or religion. You're thinking, well, you know, um, the success of the project isn't doesn't depend on being able to convince everyone who disagrees, right? The success right. of the project is to uh, try to articulate um, something that uh, is roughly like a plausible version of you know, what I would say probabilistic natural theology, where, you know, um, you know, a wide range of people can say, okay, I can understand how given these reasonable commitments, you know, uh, one would come to the conclusion that, you know, uh, theism, for example, is a plausible view and, you know, supported by, you know, the relevant evidence. So, so say um, in that epistemology case, um, so it, it seems like someone who came to that would be saying, I don't know, like I've, so I think I did, you know, like I know I've got two hands, but now how can I kind of like model that in a way where I conclude that I know that I have two hands and it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it seems a bit superfluous to the case there because it's like doing this stuff, but to articulate some, a belief that you already had, or a, I mean, knowledge that you already had in to not, you know, get into the, the sort of point there. Yeah. So, so just think about like, you know, um, a simple skeptical kind of argument, right? So, um, if, right. For all we know, we're brain in vats or something. Yeah. For, you know, you can think of like, you know, closure based arguments, right? Like, you know, if, right, you know, right, that you have hands, then, right, um, it follows from that that you do have hands. And so you're not a handless, you know, brain in the vat, you know, say, so how do you know that? Right. right. And so you can you can uh, kind of feel right that pressure. Right. To say, Well, how can you know that? Is it on the basis of perception that you know that? Right. And so what you need to do is sort of articulate, um, you know, kind of I think about this like in a way you need to articulate to yourself, right, to your own satisfaction. Right. A set of, um, you know, principles that, you know, plausibly explain how you can know things like. I'm not a handless, you know, brain in that being stimulated to, you know, believe that I'm in the real world, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, I guess maybe the thought is something like, how could we find out if we were wrong on that heuristic? You know, like if, if, um, like if, if I had, if I thought I was a brain in a vat or something, um, and I was like, I'm going to kind of model, I, I'm going to reason my way to figuring out how I can conclude that I'm a brain in a vat like how could I find out that I had a false belief in that because I think presumably like I wouldn't pl plug into the kind of um likelihood ratios or is the same as a, like in a dedu deductive argument I'm just not going to agree to like premises that get to that conclusion if I'm a consistent brain in a vat person I mean I'm like I don't think I'm a brain in a vat but just for, this is just like for the sake yeah. of so it is there something kind of more than that to deal with disagreement I suppose in that in that case Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hearing a couple different questions. So one of the questions, you know, is like, if you're imagining, so, so you're thinking, you know, imagine, like, much like I'm, you know, myself, I believe I have hands, I believe I'm not a brain in the vat. Now, let's suppose that's false, right? Let's suppose that I really am a brain in the vat. Yeah. How might I discover, right, that I'm a, a brain yeah. in the vat? And, uh, I think the question, the answer there would be like, oh, well, <laughs> it'd be really difficult to discover that. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, but then, but then, you know, the question, the sort of follow up issue is, well, do you need to be able to, right, in some sense or another, discover, right, this far fetched scenario if this far fetched scenario um, obtains, right? And I think we could, we could say, you know, let's think about that generally, right? Does that, 
um, seem like a plausible requirement, right? And um, you, you might think, okay, well, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, so here, you know, every glass of water that I have uh, drank has quenched to my thirst, right? And you think, well, might there be a glass of water out there that's going not going to right. quench my thirst? And, you know, if there were, right, how would I discover, right, that and you think, well, it's kind of such a far-fetched, you know, uh, scenario that given the evidence that I have, I don't think that that is going to obtain, right? And so if we imagine that, then you have to change so much other facts about the world that you might not be able to discover that. I, th I, th I think the worry is sort of like that, but maybe there's a little bit of a difference to it that it would be, you know, like say in the case of maybe something that's not so implausible, but something like, um, I don't know, that I'm a doctor and I think a patient, you know, like I've got the belief that a patient has HIV, right? And then... Um, okay, I, I, I know about Bayes' theorem, I know about the general kind of like base rates of the numbers of people, and I know about the likelihood and stuff, but I, but I decide I'm going to kind of do it in likelihood ratio form, and then I assess that the probability that this person is sat in front of me, given that they have HIV compared to them not having it, is like really high because I'm already kind of like committed to that in the first case. It's like, mm. in, in that case, like, how would I find out that I was wrong? Or is that just doing like, is that just doing it wrong methodologically? Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that almost sounds like, um, you know, you just got to go with the probabilities, right? Okay. Um, you know, if you have some sort of irrational belief that's influencing the probabilities, then we got to get rid of the irrational belief. But right. if there's just this this, you know, like doctors face this decision all the time, like, you know, uh, uh, overwhelmingly likely that you have, you know, condition C, but there's another uh, very rare condition, right, that mimics, right, the, the symptoms of condition C, we would have to, you know, spend a million dollars in tests to figure out whether you really have this. But, you know, let's just go with, you know, the fact that you have C. So I'm not quite sure if I'm getting exactly what you're what you're after, but that, I, it might be that I need to think about what it is that I'm trying to say there more. So I'm not. I might not be. I, like I, I might have a worry, but I'm not articulating it very well. Um, so I guess what the next kind of few questions that I have. Oh yeah. So we will come on to independence, but one of them was um, in terms of taking into account like our total evidence how do we sort of deal with like an availability bias? So someone who's a theist, for example, is going to be really familiar with what's being written in like certain theistic um, journals or, you know, like what the someone who's an atheist similarly is going to be really f familiar with what all their naturalist or physicalist friends are writing about. So where, if they come to kind of do this kind of assessment, there might be a kind of sampling bias there or an availability bias. Um, is that another one of these things that's just going to be part and parcel of using the model? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you know, that's a real issue. I mean, one of the things I like about the Bayesian framework is that you have to articulate, okay, what is the evidence? What are the hypotheses? And then what are the var various values? Right? And, and in that case, I mean, you know, it's very easy for someone to come along and say, you know, look, you know, you forgot about, right, this fact, or, hey, have you considered, um, you know, um, have you considered some of these mathematical models that scientists are using to show how you can get some of the maybe values to some of the constants, you know, following from a sort of deeper model or something like that, right? And so, I mean, they're always going to, there's, you know, always going to be the difference between people that are, you know, um, good at carrying out methodology and people that are bad at carrying out methodology, right? And so, I mean, you just, you know, uh, you, you know, this is the this is one of the things I like about philosophy is that it should be public, right? And right. you should you know be able to communicate and share your thoughts and you know um, engage with people. And uh, I think that helps us to you know um, you know it 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 helps alleviate right, like converge it, on truth. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, or at least you know realize oh you know I'm not thinking about this other thing that you know these folks are thinking about. Yeah, there's a book um, oh, that, that I use, uh, well, I used to use, I don't use it anymore, uh, but um, it's by Stuart Sutherland called Irrationality, and it's all about these psychological um, 
you know, heuristics and, and uh, biases that people have. And every time I used to teach that, I just w was depressed, you know, for a while. I'm like, golly, is it even possible to <laughs> yeah, get yeah. out of these various biases? You know, they're just so ingrained. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I I recently read um, Daniel Kahneman's book like uh, last year yeah. sometime. Um, yeah, Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's the one I use now. It's really good. And I think uh, Julia Galef did a book called The Scout Mindset that's quite good on a lot of those things where she, she looks at a bunch of cases like historically as well about um, where some of these biases have been deployed, which I quite liked. Hmm. Um, so yeah, in terms of before independence then, the last, last question before in independence would be in, to do with like evidence against. So if we're using this kind of framework, um, what should we do with evidence against? How, how do we factor that in? Yeah, it, it's factored in really easily. So you look at the relevant likelihood ratios, right? And then if they're subject to, I mean, if, if, if they're subject to independence, you can just add and multiply them or well, add and subtract them. So in the paper that I wrote, the argument um, from so many arguments, right? Um, instead of the likelihood ratio, I used the log of the likelihood ratio. Because what was that the reason for that, by the way? I didn't, yeah. It just turns uh, multiplication into addition and you know, division and subtraction, right? And so, so you can just subtract them from each other. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, if you have, right, if, if a particular piece of evidence has a log likelihood ratio of three, right, and um, another piece of evidence against theism has a log likelihood ratio of two, right, then you just subtract the one from the other. Yeah, that would be what's wrong with my uh, Excel spreadsheet then. I didn't take the logs of the uh, likelihood ratios, so it will be messed up. Oh, the final. okay, yeah. 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 I, yeah. I'll get it I mean, to do Yeah, that. there's a quick fix for that. Um, okay, so then in terms of independence, so so say we like that, that equation that you showed before where we have the sort of likelihood ratios laid out and we might have a bunch of pieces of evidence that we're kind of comparing and we multiply yeah. across them. Um, Obviously, we might be double counting. How do we deal with independence? And then I suppose specifically in the case of theism, this is something I wanted to kind of ask you about, like how many independent arguments are there for theism? Uh, one of the um, critiques of the 150 plus arguments for God that Chad McIntosh did was yeah. that, that I think in my view, there's a lot of double counting, you know, it's like um, yeah. a deductive argument, then maybe like a Bayesian argument and then like a modal argument, you know, like it's possibly yeah. necessary yeah. that and then that's what, yeah. Um, yeah. and if we do it that way, I guess there's just going to be an infinite number of like arguments for literally any position that we can think of. So how yeah. how do you get at independence in, in yeah. using this? Framework? Yeah, so the easiest way into this is just to think about the urn example that I gave earlier. Right, so you have two urns that you're selecting from. You don't know which urn you're selecting from. Um, one has a probability of two thirds of drawing a white ball. The other has a probability of one third of drawing a white ball, right? And once you specify this, which urn you're drawing from, right? Each of the draws are probabilistically independent from one another, right? So the probability of drawing a white uh, ball from urn one um, is uh, two thirds. Right, and that's the same probability if you uh, drew a white ball on the previous straw, or you know, whatever, right? And so, if you just think about that um, way of specifying independence, when it comes to the evidence for theism, you can't have like probabilistic um, influences, right, between various items of evidence, right? Um, and so, you look at, for example, like you know, the fine tuning evidence, right? And you think, well, how probable is the fine tuning evidence? Um, or, or do it do it the other way because it's easier. How probable is the cosmological evidence given the fine tuning evidence, right? And you're like, well, obviously, right? The fine tuning evidence influences. In fact, it entails, right? That the universe exists, right? So um, there, um, the cosmo the evidence of the existence of the universe isn't independent, probabilistically independent from um, given theism from the um, uh, the fine tuning evidence given theism. Right, so, um, you know, some people like Tim McGrew think that, uh, you know, okay, yeah, so the evidence is not independent, it's not a problem, we just give a more sophisticated Bayesian model, and you can do that if you want. I mean, I tend to think, well, let's just um, think about the independence, uh, think about what evidence actually is independent, uh, because then the math is just a lot simpler, and then we can kind of figure out, like, in a way, what are kind of the core pieces of evidence for theism, 
and you know, I don't, I mean, I don't have a settled view right now about how many um, pieces of evidence are independent. I was, you know, thinking uh, something along the lines of, um, you know, the, the, something like the design argument, uh, fine tuning argument, and then something like the moral argument where it's sensitivity to moral facts. Um, those seem arguably probabilistically independent given theism. Um, certain kind of miracle claims, right, seem probabilistically independent from those. Um, certain kinds of experiential claims um, seem, you know, arguably independent. Um, so if we just went with that, that gives us four um, items of evidence. And depending on how you argue about the likelihood ratios, I mean, it could be, oh, well, you know, and then you have, of course, you know, like hiddenness claims and evil, you know, the evil, the severity of, you know, evil and stuff. And so that's going to be relevant evidence, right? And so, um, you know, what the relevant likelihoods are, you know, how exactly, right, you um, figure all that stuff up and then, you know, add it all together, um, you know, that's going to be sort of in the details. But I in think, a way, oh, sorry, you got you know, what, what I'm uh, going for here is just a, a kind of a general uh, framework that, um, you know, anyone uh, could use for, um, you know, theism, atheism or, or whatever, you know, they're they're interested in these kind of cumulative case arguments. I, I think um, that maybe, again, that that comes back to that sort of disagreement question, like, um, because so you know, like for someone who is an atheist and has thought a thought about these things and come to different conclusions, maybe even um, it's, it's going to be like the one man's uh, modus ponens is another man's modus tollens type thing, where almost all of those deductive arguments that are going to be like, that would be a bit of a piece of evidence in favor of theism, like is maybe can be like run backwards, maybe not like from God doesn't exist, but something like... Um, I don't know, everything that begins to exist has a cause of its existence, but then you'd be like, so maybe I change it up to like everything that has a cause of its existence begins to exist. The universe didn't begin to exist, so the universe doesn't have a cause of its existence. You know, like you can kind of yeah. play it. Is, is that going to affect the overall kind of structure of the case there again? Like how is it just going to, is it going to come down to then just like, we've just got to appeal to more reasons for these premises or why? Yeah. I mean, it's going to come down to the particular, you know, argument. So, you know, right. there'd be debates about like how strong the fine tuning evidence is, how strong the sort of sensitivity to moral facts is, um, you know, but <laughs> you could also think, you know, in, in the end, maybe there's a, you know, an overarching, you know, so suppose for example, that you're, um, you think, you know, this disagreement shows that in some way or another, you should split the difference, right? Um, so, you know, you might think, well, geez, you know, um, certain atheists have really thought hard about this. You know, they're really smart, intelligent people. They know, you know, all the relevant evidence, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so confident in my own views, right? And so it's kind of converge, right, together. And if it, it turns out that, you know, um, if you think of your credences in theism and atheism as in some way converging, Right. You might think, well, then there's still a pragmatic argument, you know, something like a Pascal's um, wager strategy, you know. And, and what's interesting about this is I don't think like, you know, um, I mean, it's one where it's actually pretty clear about this, but I don't think people sort of realize that, you know, there's uh, in his overall project, a very sort of Pascalian theme. Right. Is that the evidence puts you to a position where theism is a plausible option. Right. Right. And plausibility doesn't have to be, you know, uh, probability greater than 0.5. It could just mean it's a, it's a plausible, it's a live option, like in the Jamesian sense of a live option, right? And so even if you do take this sort of skeptical line, you know, it turns out it's still a live option. And so, um, you know, uh, do with that what you will. I mean, I, you know, that that's an option that one can take. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm fine with that in a way, um, theoretically. I mean, I just think that, you um, to go back to the er earlier analogies, the case is kind of like, you know, arguing against the skeptic is that, you know, I think it is more reasonable to believe that we do know things uh, right. than, than not. So so um, the last question then, just because I'm a bit wary of time, this is specifically okay. to do with the way that the argument is used in favor of theism then would be like on theism as defined by Swinburne, is it more expected that we'd be able to find more good arguments for um, the existence of that deity? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what I think about that. Um, so, so you might think, you know, this gets into sort of the hiddenness issue, right? Um, um, you know, and that, I mean, it's going to depend on, you know, what you think about, you know, is certain kinds of epistemic distance required for moral growth? You know, um, you know, if I follow around, you know, my kids all day long, you know, are they going to have, um, you know, uh, the same opportunities to, you know, exercise and grow their character, right? As if I said, okay, well, look, you know, you guys have, an hour, I'm going to leave. You got to get your homework done. Um, so, I mean, that's a, itself a big debate. Um, so, I, I mean, I tend to think that, um, I mean, I, t I tend to think that, uh, you know, no, I mean, we wouldn't expect there to be, you know, tons of arguments. Um, but that's not really something I've, I've thought a lot about. I know Chad McIntosh had asked me at one point in time is like, if this kind of cumulative case reasoning shows that theism has a really incredible probability, isn't that something wrong with the view? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't, you know, that's, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming on and giving an hour of your time, you know, to talk about this stuff and kind of explain it a bit further for people. Um, is there anywhere in, in terms of like this book that you're writing, when will that be available if people are interested or anywhere that people can find out about more of your stuff if they want to dig down this rabbit hole? Yeah. So I, I do have a YouTube channel where I put some stuff up. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to put up some philosophy religion lectures um, slowly. Um, also, I have a website. Um, people can just, you know, I think it's tedposton.org okay. um, and go to it and the papers are up there and um, people can always feel free to email me. You know, and if you wanted to do a Q and A uh, section uh, session sometime, I'll be happy to do that. I just, unfortunately, my schedule is uh, uh, yeah, constrained. Yeah. So yeah, no problem. That's all right. Yeah, but it'd be great to do a Q and A uh, at some point in the future. But I'll, I'll send you an email and we can sort that out. And I'll put yeah. links for those things in the description. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for watching. I'll just play the closing credits, and then if you just hang around for ten seconds or so, um, I'll say bye. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. No problem.